seems very strange and wonderful to be sitting in this beautiful capital complex in a modern studio equipped with fantastic, mostly Japanese uh, design equipment, uh, talking to you out there in, I guess, one of about 25 or 30 different towns in West Virginia, which is my home state. Uh, I have 10 books out and a lot of short stories, but people are very kind and very curious about where it all began. Why I became a writer, why, uh, how I became a writer. And a lot of people feel that there's some, uh, some great secret to it that, I, that I'm unwilling to share. I know a lot of young writers say, well, how did you do it how, so that we can do the same thing? And you can't do the same thing because uh, it's in a different time and the whole, the, the, the scenery in, in the play has been changed and the script. Uh, I became a writer in the early 40s and 50s and through the 60s and I'm now into my 11th book. It seems to me that I'm, in every book I tried to say one thing. I'm not quite sure what it was, but I, I know in each book I'm trying to say the same thing more clearly. Uh, because a funny thing happens when, you, when you're in your 50s, or I guess in your 60s too, which I'm almost at, a writer finds that he's, uh, he's plagiarizing from himself in a funny way, even inventing his own cliches as he goes along. Because in the work in progress on this book I'm doing now, which is called Bliss, B-L-I-S-S, -S, uh, occasionally a phrase will come to me, or a metaphor, or a, a piece of imagery, and I think, no, I can't use that. I, I, it's from somebody else's work. And it is from somebody else's work. It's from my own. It's from, uh, from the work that I did uh, 1958 in Philadelphia, or 1946 in Clarksburg because there's a kind of insane persistence in every writer. Uh, I think Charles Dickens was only trying to say one thing. And if it, if it was anything, it was be happy, be kind. Uh, I think this great democratic ideal in Dickens' work and the works of men like Balzac, Zola, Robert Louis Stevenson, Barry. I think this thread of humanism has gotten tangled in the, in the mesh of certain liberal ideas that uh, have their basis more in, in economics and politics in our time than they do in the human spirit. Uh, I'm not much interested in, in, in where a country is going economically now. Uh, I think that the world is becoming conglomerated into a huge, into a huge organization in which it's going to be more difficult, if not impossible, for the individual to, to thrive. And when I say the individual, in my case, I mean a writer. Uh, frightening images of coming to me from New York in the last year I'd been there, and I heard a very prominent publishers say that within a few years there are only going to be seven or eight big publishers in, in Manhattan. I don't think there are many more big ones than that now. Doubleday, Simon Schuster, uh, Random House, Knopf. I think in probably 10 or 20 years there's only going to be one or two big publishers. So what does that mean for for a writer who's coming out of West Virginia, as I was in the 30s, who's trying to find an outlet for his, for his voice, for his particular viewpoint. Because this viewpoint is infinitely precious. I believe that. I believe that, that I, a, a young writer once came to me years ago and said, why write anything? It's all been said. And I said, yes, but not by you. And I think unless you believe in this sacred uh, individuality of everyone, then you don't believe in, in writing at all. 
because no metaphor can have any real meaning unless having originated in the mind of the poet it finds soil to to make its resurrection in the mind of somebody else. I feel that when I write a book, I'm, as I've said in a couple of inscriptions, I've written in copies of my books to people throughout the state. When I write a book, I'm sharing my mind with you. When you read my book, you're sharing your mind with me. Uh, and that is a, a kind of partaking of which I'm very, very proud and happy. I never tried to write for everybody. I think all my stories, since they were about West Virginia, were first and foremost for people back here who, who could look and say, perhaps when I was lucky, they could say, yes, it was like that in 1928 in Moundsville. That did happen, or something very like it in, uh, in Clarksburg in 1941. And I think this identity is what ties me so strongly emotionally to the people and the scenes and the institutions of, of my home state. I've become almost tiresome in certain, certain New York quarters with my harping on, on what I think are the unique splendors, horrors, and great humors of our state. Uh, the only time that uh, the world looks at us, apparently, is when we have a Buffalo Creek disaster <clears throat> or we have a coal strike. And I might as well go on the record now as saying that I have been and still am and will always be on the side of the miners in any such uh, dispute. because I grew up with miners and I knew mine owners. And I find it hard to understand uh, such disparities in, in, in economics as a coal miner asking for what he wants and a man who sat in the Daniel Boone coffee shop the other day, very nice man and a hardworking man who told me he was making $125,000 a week. So there must be money I'm going to write a, in my novel I'm working on now. I have a, a story about a, a big mine where, known only to a few miners and the company, uh, they strike a vein of gold and they work it for 20 or 30 years. And the, there's all it's a fantasy, but uh, finding this one miner develops a thing which is diagnosed as gold lung which is a terrible problem because he's, he needs medical attention, but the company won't let him off the property to go to the hospital because he is carrying around his chest three or four hundred dollars worth of the company gold. And that'll give you just an idea of the, of the kind of fabric I'm working this new book out of. It's a book that takes place in an estate called Echo Point, which is People around Wheeling will know that there is a Echo Point in the Wheeling Hills, uh, out past Woodsdale, I believe. Where my, it's the place where my dad grew up and, and, and my family lived. My my grandfather was Jake Grubb in Wheeling, Jacob W. Grubb, who ran a jewelry store at 12th and Chaplin, and he had a home called Echo Point, built about 1870, I guess. It's a marvelous steamboat Gothic house. And I just can't think of taking off on any book uh, without a West Virginia base, because this is, I, I, can't, I can't quite visualize things happening in the world without their happening here. I had a problem with this book. I, I had what I thought was three books. I had a book on New York City. I had one on, the start in Paris, France, and one that started Echo Point which is somewhere up between the town of Glory, which is, which is Moundsville, and, and Wheeling, in a kind of a mythical county. Uh, I've called Moundsville by several names, Adena, Elizabethtown, uh, and Glory. And I think, I can't think of any, I've had several names for Moundsville, though. 
because it is several places to me. It's, it's, it's every city I've ever known, in a way. Because these three books that I told you about, the one in Paris, the one in New York, and the one in West Virginia, all came together one night, as things often do, in that kind of a half that slumbrous state before you fall asleep, after you close your eyes, and you're starting to shut out the sounds of the city, the rumble of coal trucks, the laughter of people out on Capitol and Washington Street. And suddenly all these three books just merged into a, the three streams as the Monongahela and the Allegheny form the Ohio. And now I'm just carried, swept away on the tide of this, uh, this tumultuous idea. And I'm not going to talk about it because I've, uh, I'm just going to tell you that to be on the lookout for it. And I don't even know that it's going to get written. You never know that. Having an idea for a book is like suddenly being the owner of a, of a bear, a, train, a bear that you have to train. He's not trained when you get him. He's a wild, wild animal. And you either train him or he, he devours you. I've had ideas just turn on me. It's, uh, Dr. Will Foster of Morgantown really key, uh, put, the, put his finger on the key to this thing when he asked me about what he called the demonic uh, influence in my work. And he asked me that once at Mars Harvey a couple of springs ago when I was there for the Arts and Humanities Council. I didn't, I answered him in a very flippant way. I, I said I didn't write from any demonic influence, that I was just talking to the people of West Virginia. But he's right, you see, there is a demonic influence. There is something that, that comes out of the cosmos. Some random idea, some, some, some unborn novel, some, some uh, something that's looking for its genesis in a human mind. I think all these uh, ideas come through our minds from other regions of the imagination and will. Uh, I don't mean to say that uh, I look upon my work as particularly, particularly uh, divinely guided, but I think all writing is through us. In the phrase of, I believe, Emerson, we become pipes for omnipotence to play through. Uh, I know that sounds heavy and maybe, uh, maybe even pretentious, but I, I am very pretentious about my, my work. I, 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 uh, I don't feel that I've ever, I've never made fun of West Virginia. I've written about funny people here and I've written about some dreadful things that happened. But it was always West Virginians doing something to other West Virginians, which distresses me like a, a fight in my neighborhood block uh, in Moundsville or somebody burning down a house in the block on Heartland Avenue at Clarksburg or out on Liberty. Uh, I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't write without music, incidentally, and I brought my, one of my tools along. And I thought particularly appropriate today was the opening to a piece of music that, that changed the history of, of Western music in the same way that the, I believe it was the Mannheim School in Germany developed from Bach the extended crescendo after Bach and out of that came the whole symphony. People stood up and roared with rage when this piece was played in 1912 or 13 in Paris. But it was expressing something that, something about spring that I feel, I felt the other day over at Point Pleasant as I was looking out at the river. All the snow was gone, and I've been riding around the snow of West Virginia all this past winter, skidding off the road on a Greyhound up at uh, up near Ravenswood, uh, scooting up and down with 
my friends in the library, Merle Moore, Shirley Mills, all over the state. Kind of like a crazy old country drummer spreading his wares. In my case, it's stories. And I pick up stories all over the all over the joint. I know I was in the I was in the recreation pool room in Clarksburg one night, many years ago. A man came in, plumped his hands down on the bar beside me and said, give me a beer. I looked over and I saw L-O-V-E-H-A-T-E. -E. I never looked at his face. It was like a, it was like a blow. It, 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 it startled me, particularly that left hand hate. I never looked at his face. I went in the back with my beer, shot a game of pool with a man named Nick, who was at the bar, who I think ran the recreation. Marvelous pool shot. But I carried that little image of those two hands, love and hate, in my mind, never knowing where I was going to use them. And this is the way ideas are picked up. You find some fantastic woman like Rachel Kutcher out of Quiet Dell in Clarksburg. And I store her in my mind, the great tenderness of this rough, raw farm woman. And they're all over West Virginia still, even to this day. And I'd heard the story of the murders at Quiet Dell, and that kind of fitted in together. The fact that Rachel lived at Quiet Dell, where there'd been murders. And that uh, I needed somehow to move all this over to the High River, because I'm a Marshall County in Palmyra much more in Marshall County than I am in Harrison County. I'll get to, to, to those distinctions a little later. But Rachel, in 1953, became the fairy godmother in A Night of a Hunter, and the tattoos found their way onto the hands of Robert Mitchum. <coughs> Tell me where his fancy bread are in the heart or in the head. <coughs> Shakespeare asked, and I don't know the answer, he didn't either. Is it intellectual? Is it psychic? Is it emotional? Is it some kind of a working out of your own animus, your own sexuality, your own aggressions? Yes, because I'm every character in all my books. I am preacher as every bit as much as Rachel. I am the hound of heaven, as, as, he, as it were, <laughs> in the image of preacher Harry Powell. And I've noticed a curious thing in the last, uh, last few months since I've been here <coughs> on this grand park. This is a vile habit to which I'm devoted, smoking. At any rate, uh, Mitchum and now possibly somebody even better known, an actor is there's a possibility that there's going to be a remake of The Night of the Hunter. How so much for that. Because I'm not interested in these things. I'm interested in uh, getting my new book done. And I want to write this book in West Virginia. Because always in the 30s and 40s, I had the feeling that I was being suffocated here. I hate to have you have to choose between Stravinsky and me. Or to, to somehow insult this work of art by making it kind of a, an adjunct or background to my remarks. But I want you to know how, how many nights I sit up in the, my room at the, at the Daniel Boone in front of my typewriter and I turn this on or I turn on something by WC or I throw in a cassette of the Ravel, uh, a G minor piano concerto or the one for left hand in D. And all this will kind of sum up the pictures that I have to have in my head, on my receptor, before I can, before I can get a character on paper. I met a marvelous man the other day in Moundsville, Glendale, an obstetrician and gynecologist from New Zealand. And I'm, uh, I'm very fond of children, very small children. He told me, to my delight, that he had delivered 20,000 babies. He's not an old man. Except as I am old, he's about my age. 
And he's in great trouble all the time because he insists upon using magnificent techniques that are sometimes, I guess, hundreds of years old. He has a thing called childbirth without violence, in which in a, in a darkened room, as I understand it, the father delivers his own child. And that just uh, kind of staggers your mind. He tells me that uh, the whole life of a child is dependent on that first half hour being handled by his father, smelling the father, and the mother, and so forth. It just overwhelmed me to, to, to think of this, of this, this half hour being a key to a person's whole life. And yet I think I decided to be a writer when I was about three. I've been trying to track it back with a kind of, with a kind of Alex Haley savagery to find out when I became a writer. I can't remember when it first was that I said to myself when I looked in the mirror over the, the wash basin, which is about to hear on me, you are a writer. I can't, I, I can't imagine ever not having been a writer. It is, I wasn't a prodigy in any sense. I was a very, uh, to all intents and purposes, a very stupid, mischievous, rather sad child. I made horrible grades in school, the worst. To the disappointment of my father and mother both, I come home with my report card just bristling with Fs or Ds. It looked like a cold, there were so many Fs on it sometimes. And I didn't realize until the last few years that I still was working like a, like a fiend and working harder than the other kids in school to, 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 to root out, to ferret out the things that I had to have, that I knew I would have to have. Like a wild animal up in Canaan Valley or in, uh, up at Smoke Hole in the woods. We'll, we'll, we'll know that certain roots and herbs and, and certain foods are gonna supply a certain need the way certain animals will eat foods of, of a specific kind during gestation. Uh, and they weren't always West Virginia things. I, I've never been to Europe because uh, I never could afford it when I, uh, when I wanted to go. And when I had the money, I generally had some other reason I had to stay in New York or Philadelphia. But I have such a good imagination that by reading, I can almost feel I've been there. So that I can be riding on a bus through Clarksburg and suddenly into my mind will flash a, a line of poetry from Francois Villon or Joaquin du Bellay. Something that has apparently would have to any scholar <clears throat> only the most obscure metaphorical reference to the Ohio Valley. And yet when Du Bellay speaks in his sonnet, the great sonnet Ure Qui Comilis, about his river valley in 16th century France, he's talking specifically to me. Uh, I'm going to have to rest and have a smoke. <laughs>